Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and I'm welcomed by Dr. Fondero again. Um, how are you doing, Dr. Fondero? Gabrielle? I'm great. How are you doing? Uh, I am really good. Um, no complaints over here. I know uh, we're just chatting off air and Gabrielle has been inundated with kind of messages and questions since the last podcast came out. And so we definitely wanted to get her on again to answer some of your questions and kind of delve further into things. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. Uh, So we wanted to start off the podcast with some background about Gabrielle, her own experiences with things, uh, because that was some of the questions the listeners had. And I think that actually provided a lot of value, your own kind of experiences and how you dealt with it, uh, because many people probably have suffered something similar or suffered or dealt with something similar. I don't know if that's something you want to delve into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It's not something that I've talked about to any great extent. And, you know, there's like a a privacy factor and an ick factor and something that, you know, a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking about. Um, And it's not something that they even will sometimes bring up with their doctor. I think in many cases, people just assume that because they've been living with symptoms for so long that it might be normal. Um, And that's not necessarily the case. So I have, I know um, one person had asked about my experiences while competing, I think when they meant, you know, uh, was when it was on a, when I was doing my physique competition and prepping for that. Um, but I also have a background in endurance sports. So when I was in um, undergrad through graduate school, I actually was doing a lot of trail running and distance running. So I was doing anywhere from five to seven miles um, Monday through Friday, and then eight plus, and usually it was more like 10 to 13 on Saturday and, and Sunday. And it was around that time that I started getting symptoms of IBS. Basically, I was having intermittent abdominal pain, um, diarrhea pretty much every time after I did a long distance run. And so the cute name for that is runner's trots, which sounds like it would be you know like a fun way to warm up, but it's not. That's just sort of the layman's term for having um, diarrhea symptoms after an endurance event. And, um, it got to the point where my symptoms were so severe and I was probably, you know, I was even kind of suffering. I didn't know at the time, but you know, from, from symptoms of dehydration because it was so chronic and I didn't really know how to properly fuel when I was going on these long runs. So I was sometimes not choosing the wisest sources of carbohydrates. Like sometimes they would be, um, too fibrous Mm -hmm. or, you know, it was just something that like, I thought, okay, fruit's a good idea or fig Newtons or something like that. And, um, you know, I hadn't ever at that point, I I really wasn't, um, especially like early on in early undergrad, I really wasn't aware of, you know, proper um, carbohydrate uh, concentrations and sport beverages and things like that. And because I was coming from a place also of disordered eating, I was really hesitant to properly fuel for those workouts because I thought, okay, I don't want to, you know, ingest a bunch of carbohydrate and then go on these long runs. Um, And that's something that really isn't talked about commonly either is that you know especially in female endurance athletes um disordered eating is prevalent and even just um insufficient energy intake Mm -hmm. you know even if it's not coming from a place of disordered eating just enough to support um their exercise habits and we find that in many cases athletes are often under consuming carbohydrate so that was my first experience with GI issues related to exercise. And I did go to a gastroenterologist. I ended up having to go through the whole process of getting a colonoscopy and everything. Okay. Yeah. So like the whole laxative preparation. Oh my gosh, it was crazy. Fortunately, there was nothing, um, wrong in terms of like the anatomy of my gut, everything was normal. And so he basically just, you know, put me on antispasmodics to help treat the um, abdominal pain, cramping and frequency of bowel movements. But that wasn't really getting to the core issue, which now I know was probably what we what we see in the literature with endurance athletes, we have changes in blood flow to the gut, which leads to changes in pH, oxygen availability, um, depending on the concentration of carbohydrate beverage, the osmolarity of whatever you're putting into the gut that can cause um, more water pulling into the gut. Um, 
excess fructose consumption because it tends to hang around in the gut a little bit longer. It's uh, absorbed more slowly. That can pull more water into the intestines as well and just basically cause um, diarrhea just because there's so much water then in the gut. Um, and I wasn't, you know, doing any sort of supplementation with probiotics or anything like that. That's something that, you know, limited studies has been shown to be helpful for endurance athletes. When I enter the realm of competing um, and, and what I see even with, with clients and once we get like kind of later into the cut and calories get really low, fats get really low, um, a lot of people seem to experience just the polar opposite and having chronic constipation. And that can be very uncomfortable. It comes with bloating and just feelings of fullness. You're already fatigued and maybe your food's getting boring and now you haven't gone to the bathroom in two days and it just really makes things much worse. Um, so yeah, I absolutely had experienced that as well and unfortunately I think a lot of people resort to using stimulant laxatives and I've mentioned it before that you can actually form a dependence on stimulant laxatives things like bisacodyl um, that that over time you actually can't really have a bowel movement without using those wow. um, yeah so uh, because it, it it interferes with sort of the nervous system function of the digestive tract so while those might be okay for you know once in a while if you're experiencing constipation that's not something that you really want to fall back on for for chronic use um there are non-stimulant laxatives that that could help like miralax is one it's just um basically helps to it's an osmolite it helps to pull uh fluid into the gut so that can help kind of hydrate the contents help those move through um you know, it, adding fiber supplements may or may not help. If it's a fermentable type of fiber, like psyllium husk, and um, depending on like the profile of your gut microbiome, like everything, um, if those are uh, heavily fermented and you produce a lot of gas, actually as excess gas can exacerbate constipation. What? Um, so that's one issue. Or, you, you know, you could go with, like I've mentioned, citrus cell before, which is uh, not as readily fermentable. That helps to kind of create bulk and, um, uh, you know, facilitate transit as well. So those are some options for a non-stimulant um, solution. And then of course, increasing water intake can really help as well. You know, when you're talking about like later in a cut, gastric motility decreases. So basically that your digestive system moves a little bit more slowly so that you can more readily absorb all the nutrients. Um, and then, you know, if you have really low fat intakes, well, fat actually helps to lubricate transit. So you've removed that, but you may still be having a really high protein, high refuse diet. And so if you're getting still a lot of fiber and a lot of people are increasing their vegetable intake to stave off some of that hunger, then those issues can exacerbate the constipation as well. Um, so it is really person specific and I have experienced, you know, both ends of the spectrum, um, which, which happens when you go to really any extreme. I mean, if you're looking at running, you know, dozens of miles per week or you are an extreme caloric deficit and, you know, overreaching and your sleep is really poor. We know that there's links between um, sleep, circadian rhythms, and the, and the biome. All of these factors come into play. And um, so in terms of what I've done, you know, I really try to avoid the, the stimulant laxative route. And um, I didn't use this the antispasmodics, you know, unless I really needed them if I was like experiencing symptoms. Um, but I stick with just drinking plenty of water per day. Uh, it, you you want to go for basically a meal per calorie that you ingest during the day. And then for every hour of workout, about another two to three cups. So I'm drinking plenty of water each day. Um, I know what foods uh, tend to, to sit with me well and, and what don't. So I usually avoid the cruciferous vegetables. And there are some other high FODMAP foods. Like I know asparagus is one that will just completely set me off. So there are just some foods that I don't include in my diet because I know that they're going to exacerbate symptoms. Um, if I do feel like, you know, I'm, things aren't moving normally, I will opt for a citrusel um, and Miralax. And even just increasing um, the fat content of the diet for a little while can really help. Uh, I sometimes will do, especially before bed, like chia seeds or flax meal before bed. 
that just keeps good things moving in the morning. <laughs> um, and then also even drinking hot beverages, especially like hot caffeinated beverages. Uh, coffee will definitely help. Hot tea can really help as well. So, um, you know, it is really person specific, but I would say, you know, avoid the, the stimulant laxative route um, if possible and stick with things that sort of work with your digestive tract and, you know, experiment with what foods sort of might set you off um, and drink plenty of water. Those are probably boring, um, you know, prudent, pragmatic yeah. <laughs> suggestions as usual. Um, you know, trying to, there, there's not a lot that's like <laughs> super sexy to talk about with poop, but <laughs> it is what it is. Um, yeah, so that, that's my stuff. No, I, I really like that. And I think it's helpful for the listeners as well, because I think, during contest prep, especially when you've been, or just dieting for a long period of time, constipation is something that is kind of, it, just digestion on, in general is just, you notice things much more because you're just far more focused on your physique. So when you are bloated, you see it much more. When you are not able to go to the loo, it's just, you just notice these things more. And um, with my experience with myself and clients, luckily we haven't had anything, I've not experienced anything where it's been an extreme where anything particularly bad's happened. Um, but there has been times where maybe in like, I've done like peak weeks with people where we have reduced fiber intake to try and reduce mm -hmm. bloating. And then that leads to the kind of the constipation. So it's kind of finding that right balance. Um, you mentioned coffee actually, and that's something that people bring up. And um, obviously people know about kind of, coffee makes you poop is like a, the, the funny joke that everyone knows. And I guess that's, that's a real thing. And some people talk about it being kind of a negative thing. Like it's kind of an, like a bad thing that it causes that. I don't know if that's a concern for people or what's your thoughts on that? Um, well, you know, just like with anything, the, there's the, the dose makes the poison. And, you know, if you are, experiencing some people experiencing uh will experience loose stools diarrhea after drinking coffee and you know if that if that's a a common occurrence or you're experiencing cramping and belly pain and things like that um then that's definitely not going to be beneficial when you are considering the effect on the microbiome um, you really have to consider things like transit time. So that's how long does it take food to move through your digestive tract? So we have, you know, gastric emptying time is going from the stomach to the small intestine. And then we have transit time through the small intestine all the way out to the other end. And if you are expediting that, then you may be preferentially supporting types of bacteria that are okay with rapid transit, um, both in terms of just the um, uh, mechanical forces. So as chyme, uh, this digestive food is moving through the small and then into the large intestine. And then, you know, once we get to the colon, we're starting to talk about feces, but it's like digested food products. As this is moving through, it's causing friction against the cells of the, of the intestinal wall. And while we do have this awesome, you know, protective layer of mucus, um, some of the bacteria can hang out in the mucus and they can probably hang on pretty tight and they're okay with rapid transit. Then we have bacteria that like to hang out in the lumen or the inside of the intestine. If you think of it like a hose, that's where the water's moving through. And so if you have rapid transit of the chyme, or digestive, uh, digested food products moving through the intestine, and you can actually kind of kick out some of those beneficial bacteria that might be residing in the lumen. Um, you're also reducing the time that the, ha that the bacteria have to spend with the nutrients in the food that you've ingested. So you're not just feeding yourself, you're actually also feeding the bacteria there. So some of them are going to be okay relying just solely on uh, carbohydrate sources, but others are what we call facultative anaerobes. So they can use carbohydrates, but then they can also use other things to produce energy as well. And those guys are okay with, you know, they're happy if they've got some oxygen available, they're happy if they don't. And then we have obligate anaerobes, which can only use glucose for energy. So keeping in mind that, you know, the, it's not just the pH, I've talked about that before, but the pH of the gut, absolutely, what you're eating, absolutely, and then how fast is that food moving 
through your digestive tract. All of those factors can influence the profile of the microbiome. And so if you have rapid transit, which is something that we can see in patients who have IBS, some of them have chronic constipation, some will have chronic diarrhea, um, that rapid transit in some cases does seem to affect certain taxa of bacteria. Um, but that's not always the case. And it's not something that's been looked at, you know, extensively and because we are so different in terms of our microbial profiles it's very hard to say that you know there's a distinct profile for a person who might have loose stools versus a person who has constipation um, but we do see that there are some relationships there so enough to say that if you have chronic constipation or chronic diarrhea or even a short bout of diarrhea that the transit time can affect the profile of of the gut so in that case is that kind of like if you're having your coffee and then you're having a rapid kind of you drink it and you're immediately to the toilet is that an indication that it's maybe not an ideal thing for you to be doing or maybe i don't know if you need to eat or counterbalance it somehow so it's kind of not so dramatic i'm not sure Mm -hmm. um one way that you could um kind of qualitatively assess that is through your stool um texture so um, I, because I did have some questions about, you know, what, like, how do I know if like, if my poop is healthy, yeah, yeah. you know, am I having good bowel movements? So um, there is a Bristol stool scale that they use. They rate the, the stool texture on a scale of one to seven, one being constipated, sort of like really small hard pellets like rabbit pellets (laughs) and then there's severe diarrhea which is entirely liquid and you sort of want to be in the middle so if you're having um, bowel movements that are pretty firm but come out easily then you're okay even if your coffee did make you have a bowel movement more rapidly it's sort of you know when we talk about caffeine people thought that it was a diuretic because Mm -hmm. it makes you uh, and thought it would dehydrate you It may have diuretic properties, but that doesn't mean that it's going to dehydrate you. It just means that, yeah, you may diurese or you may urinate sooner, but you're not going to urinate more than you ingested. So you can still have net hydration effect. So just because the coffee is making you go to the restroom sooner, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's having a deleterious effect. So you can look at your stool and and if it's firm and it was comfortable, then you're fine. If it is really a watery consistency, then you're looking at maybe mild diarrhea and that's not necessarily a good thing but that's not that doesn't mean that it was the coffee it could have been something else that you've eaten Um, because when you're looking at what's exiting your body that's food that you may have eaten uh, I mean the, the, the range is pretty wide but you know four, six, up to 30 hours ago, depending on your transit time. Yeah. So that's the other thing is individuals have differing transit times. So there's not necessarily, you know, uh, what is normal. I get, I get that question a lot. What's normal? Well, it's really based on what's normal for you um, in terms of, you know, looking at people with IBS, uh, um, D, so the people who have diarrhea, they're going to have really uh, rapid transit times, whereas people who have chronic constipation will have very slow transit times. So um, if it's something that's abnormal for you, like say, you know, you're regular and you go to the restroom every day, if you're going out to two or three days, that's going to be very uncomfortable. But for a person who only goes every three days, then that's normal for them. Yeah, and I'm sure uh, the listeners will probably be able to identify that if they're kind of in a mass versus in a maintenance versus a cut, kind of <laughs> the, the amount of times you go to the toilet kind of change depending what phase you're on. Um, exactly, yeah. I think it's brilliant that you talked about kind of the transit time because I think a lot of people relate to, and I, I, for, I we were talking off air about I've had an experience that's I, I would deem as kind of, yeah, it's not great, my stools aren't um, perfect. And I was trying to work out what it was and I know you can't diagnose me. I know um, it's more of just a, a chat about uh, trying to define what it is. But I was always associating associating with my breakfast. First thing in the morning, I'd kind of have kind of quite loose stools. And this is like every single morning, it seems to happen. So I trialed just like not having breakfast. I trialed changing my breakfast and it was just still happening. So this is now making me think it's probably something I'm having the day before or the night prior that's causing this. 
Exactly. Yeah. I usually recommend that you don't necessarily want to, if you have stomach upset, unless you get like, you get like a foodborne illness, then yeah, you may have symptoms pretty much right away. But if it's not related to a foodborne illness and you're waking up and having these symptoms right after breakfast, it's probably not breakfast yeah. because gastric emptying time just to get the food out of your stomach to your small intestine takes anywhere from one to four hours. And then you probably have another 10 hours of it traveling through your small and large intestine. So yeah, it is probably whatever you're eating the night before that's reached your colon and has then caused whatever issues you might be having in the bathroom. And then when we're looking at kind of trying to figure out what foods it could be is the best place to start kind of looking at the FODMAPs, the kind of traditional kind of culprits. Yeah, now that I've had more clients that are interested in sort of gut health and that are um, sharing with me their their gastric uh, symptom, their gastric upset symptoms, that's usually the first thing that I'll recommend. Um, we're sort of in a, a era of like throw all the supplements at it, and you know everyone's saying probiotics, probiotics. And I am really of the opposite approach. I want to simplify things and try to control as many variables as possible. Awesome. You know, if I throw 15 different supplements at you, maybe one will work, but we don't know which one it is. And I don't expect you to live off of, you know, $120 of supplements every month for the rest of your life. So it's much easier to go with that FODMAP diet, which is not a, an especially restrictive diet. It still contains fruits, vegetables, grains, um, lean proteins, healthy fats. It's just which are, are going to be staples in the diet. And then after you sit with that, the recommendations are about two to three weeks. Then you can start reincorporating foods that you'd like to, to try in your diet again. Um, and then, you know, if you have symptoms, remove that food. And then that's probably a trigger for you. If not, then you know that you can reintegrate that food and, and keep that in your diet consistently. I'd say the biggest trigger usually, you know, most most people are going to have some level of lactose intolerance. So that one that's kind of easy to, to, you know, narrow down, not having dairy. Um, a lot of people ask about removing gluten. And there are, there's more research coming out about other compounds that are found in wheat that okay. may be causing an inflammatory response. Um, and it's not just, it, so it's not just gluten. It could be um, fructin, which is a specific type of fiber that can be fermented and cause gas. Um, there are other compounds that these plants use as sort of self-defense against uh, pests. And those may actually be binding to receptors of our innate immune system and causing an inflammatory response. Um, so it may not be gluten at all. It may be something else, but you're by removing wheat, you may be removing all these other compounds as well. Um, so not to say, you know, not necessarily that you need to remove gluten, but you could be removing other things that could be causing issues. Mm -hmm. So I say start simple and, you know, don't necessarily go towards it because the other thing, like I've mentioned before, you don't necessarily know what you're getting with supplements. Um, and, you know, if you're taking things like digestive enzymes and whatnot, well, if you, even if you have dysbiosis, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have an issue producing digestive enzymes because those digestive enzymes are not coming from the bacteria. Um, you know, your pancreas is producing plenty of enzymes. Now, people can have um, a pancreatic enzyme in insufficiency. So that, that's actually a diagnosable disease where you're not producing digestive enzymes. But assuming you're producing sufficient digestive enzymes in response to food that's entering your gut, taking extra digestive enzymes isn't going to help. And those enzymes are pH specific also. Yep. So you may be ingesting them. And then once they hit your stomach, they're pretty much just denatured slash destroyed. And, and then you can't use them anyway. So, um, yeah, so that's my, my recommendation is usually start simple, try the FODMAP approach and then go from there rather than buy all of this stuff. No, I, I absolutely love that approach because, um, I think it, it's just, we are in a day and age where there's so many more supplements coming out and everyone's just, everyone wants that quick fix rather than having to change mm -hmm. something in their lifestyle. So I love that. And 
Um, unfortunately, I think I might have to drop some dairy because that's what's consistently what I have before bed is some kind of Greek yogurt or quark or something along those lines. Otherwise, mm-hmm. something else changes. So that may well be what it is for me. Um, and I need to be not less stubborn with that. So no, <laughs> that's really interesting. And actually, I, I just want to delve into it because we've talked about kind of the bloating, uh, the diarrhea, and these are kind of symptoms of potentially something not being right. What's wrong with that apart from it just being, obviously, it's uncomfortable. Um, but what is actually what's going on that's potentially that we sort of like people might be thinking oh it's worth maybe people think it's worth the food or whatever it might be is there is there a bad is that a bad thought process for them to have um well like i mentioned when we're talking about you know taking care of our gut bacteria we have to be cognizant of how long they can spend um with the nutrients in our gut so if we're eating something that is causing um diarrhea that's probably going to be the one of the most problematic things because now you are speeding transit um you're reducing their time with the nutrients there and you may even be reducing your ability to uh, like very likely reduce your ability, uh, your ability to uh, uh, absorb the nutrients uh, in that food as well. So, yeah, I, I would say that it's more than just it being uncomfortable. It's that you are reducing your ability to harvest nutrients from the diet um, and also preferentially supporting bacteria who uh, have rapid growth rates. That's not necessarily always a bad thing, but it can be problematic if you're talking about pathogenic bacteria that have rapid growth rates. That means that they're going to be able to survive more readily than others that may grow a little bit more slowly. Um, One uh, important bacteria that we've linked to some health benefits and just kind of um, what we see in athletes are Prevotella. And those are fairly slow growers. So if you are having, you know, rapid transit of, of the chyme, then maybe you're not giving them enough time to proliferate. Um, that being said, I've seen, you know, and like I said, there's not a ton of research in this area. Um, I have seen, and it also depends on how we're studying it. That's a whole other, <laughs> how we're actually identifying what bacteria are present. That's a whole other issue. But um, even if we do have rapid transit, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are going to completely knock them out. So there have been some studies that have shown that even if we have um, expedited transit, it seems like Prevotilla can still hang out. Um, so, you know, a lot of it is, is sort of speculation and just like this might happen. So it's probably better to err on the side of caution okay. rather than saying, you know, this is certainly going to happen. Like, oh, if you have diarrhea, you're going to have severe dysbiosis and things like that. Because the other thing is, you know, when we look at um, our profiles over time, like in, in one person, even if we st- if we even if we put them on antibiotics and things happen, I mean, because this is you know real life. We get sick. We have to take antibiotics. We have changes in our food intake and things like that. Um, you may have taxonomic changes, so you may have changes in what bacteria are present, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have huge changes in function. So when we look at, you know, what what species are present or what taxa are present, that's very different from saying what is the function of your gut, because you may knock out some strains that, um, you know, metabolize carbohydrates, but your overall the the metagenomic looking at, you know, the genes of metabolic processes, you may have other bacteria that then take their place and do the same thing, they have the same function. So, you know, we, they're, they're not really um, siloed in terms of like this one bacteria does this one thing. And if you lose it, that's going to have lasting and deleterious effects. It's that you can have these minor changes in taxa over time, but you have a generally relatively, a generally a stable um, uh profile and a stable functional profile. And that really seems to be kind of dependent on your diet. So if you're eating a diet that's high in carbohydrate, then when you go and, and examine the genes present in those bacteria, you're going to have a lot of bacteria that metabolize carbohydrate. And the same thing if you switch just to a diet that's high in animal proteins or higher in fats. So, um, 
aside, so looping back to your original question, um, aside from it being, you know, uncomfortable, yes, I would say that there are, you know, health effects to think about because you want to make sure that you're absorbing and utilizing the nutrients in your diet and that you're also um, allowing time for um, a, a diverse array of bacteria to thrive in your gut as well. No, really well explained. And I was trying to think of a, a simple analogy and I almost thought it was too simple. It's kind of like I, I was thinking of when you kind of refuel your car with like the wrong like petrol versus diesel and it's the wrong one. And <laughs> so everything just doesn't function as well. But I thought that was too vast. Uh, <laughs> no, that actually is. That, that's, a, that's a really good analogy to look at. Um, when we're looking at these different taxa of bacteria, I think it gets lost sort of how how general we, we can, we, how generally we look at them and classify them and how limited we are in, in looking at like specific species and specific strains. And in most cases, you know, we're limited a, by the fact that we're looking at fecal samples. Um, well, just like I mentioned, when we're talking about transit and, time and feces moving through the intestine, that's going to pick up bacteria and carry them out. And so we can get a bacterial profile of feces. But the problem is that it's likely overrepresenting. And this has actually been shown in a couple recent um, papers that were really interesting, that the fecal samples of bacteria aren't really representative, especially of the small intestine and even the, the stomach. We do have some um, bacteria bacteria that reside in the stomach as well. So in our upper digestive tract, those guys are sort of being misrepresented and probably left out of these fecal samples. And even when we look at those fecal samples, one of the primary ways that we um, identify bacterial taxa is through 16S RNA sampling. And um, we can get uh, pretty specific, but it starts to become really hard to look at actually specific species of bacteria there. So when we say something like, and I have even been, I'll say I've been guilty of this and, and just like I would hope any researcher, any scientist would, you know, evidence is causing me to change my mind and more information is causing me to change my mind. But when we say something like um, there are more Formicutes versus Bacteroidetes, that's sort of like saying there are more invertebrates than vertebrates. It's that general. So if you think of us like we're, we're like an alien species studying Earth. And one scientist says, oh, there are more invertebrates than vertebrates on this planet. Well, that's a piece of information, but it's so general. It really doesn't tell us anything about those specific vertebrates. And then if we take it down and, and imagine that we're sort of in a, in a helicopter and we're looking down at uh, the planet and we can see that there are a bunch of animals down there that look like dogs, sort of. They could be dogs, they could be wolves, they could be coyotes. And from a, from a distance, they may all look pretty much the same. Okay, like they're vertebrates, they're carnivores. But when you get down to the actual species and subspecies level, there's a big difference between a wolf and a golden retriever. Yeah. <laughs> and, and those are the differences that we really can't see very well with our current technology. Um, we can fairly... Uh, fairly well determine, you know, how many wolves we have um, versus dogs to, to some extent. But even that, we can't get down to like, you know, it's very difficult to say, oh, this is this is a golden retriever versus um, a pit bull versus a poodle, you know. And so um, we have to be cognizant of how limited I think we are and, and how people are interpreting their results and um you know how how then the readers are and the media are then interpreting and 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 you know relaying those results as well no i think that's it's a really refreshing perspective to have to be well if you're a true scientist you are staying up to date with latest evidence science is dynamic it's always evolving so it's really refreshing to hear that because even with the amount of limited evidence there is now, and I don't know very much about gut health, but I see people being very dogmatic and black and white about things. And it's kind of 
kind of upsetting to an extent uh, because it's definitely not as you've clearly said. Um, something you touched on earlier that I think uh, was a question we had through the podcast. I've certainly heard it before. And it's kind of the idea that we don't um, get maybe the calories from food that we don't digest. Kind of you are what you digest and assimilate is maybe a term that I've heard thrown around before. And I know like people might have heard that you can have too much fiber and you can end up kind of not getting the nutrients from your food. Is this mm-hmm. similar to like if you're not digesting foods properly? Is it down to the calories or can we get the calories and the protein and the macros from it still? Or are we, what are we missing out on exactly if we are missing out on anything? Um, well, I mean, you can look at it in terms of, of relating to developing countries where they have these sort of communicable diseases, cholera and things like that, that cause severe chronic diarrhea. Um, it's one reason that we will dose our livestock with antibiotics to protect against these communicable diseases. Um, so even if your digestive issues are not due to illness, due to a communicable disease, um, you know, like, or something like Giardia or, or whatnot, if you are having um, chronic gastric issues, then that can certainly play a role in the nutrient availability then to your body. Um, what you, you know, the, and, and the gut bacteria, they help produce uh, vitamins as well. So like vitamin K, that's why infants are given a shot of vitamin K because they don't really have the bacterial um, load that they need. Breast milk is not high in vitamin K. And so that's one protective mechanism. Um, and then you have some other bacteria that help produce very small amounts of B12, um, folate, and and so if you are you know wiping out these bacteria and if you are uh, unable to then digest and then fully absorb those nutrients that could certainly lead to you know we see in in young children failure to thrive um, and in adults weight loss or you know difficulty gaining weight um, your recovery is going to be affected your performance is going to be affected it can certainly lead to dehydration as well um, because you know normally you're not losing as much water and feces, but when you have something like diarrhea, then you can certainly be at risk for dehydration as well. Um, so, you know, what, what exactly you might be missing that, that I would just, you know, have to guess on that, but, um, you certainly would have reduced caloric intake for sure, for sure. Yeah. Because you, know, you need to actually be absorbing those nutrients. So if they're just passing through, then you're going to be probably in an unintended caloric deficit. And, you know, those bacteria won't be able then to have time to ferment those fibers and things like that. So um, definitely something that if you are having chronic diarrhea, like don't be ashamed or don't be embarrassed to go to your doctor and ask about it. It could be a dietary change, but, you know, there could be something else going on. And not to say that, you know, there's anything wrong with taking, um, uh, prescription drugs to help treat it because that can be something that you do for a short period of time that actually has lasting beneficial effects. You could also have a, a communicable disease that you don't know about. Like maybe you have picked up a foodborne mm-hmm. illness or C. diff or H. pylori or something. And so going and getting a test can actually be really beneficial, not just for you, but for people mm-hmm. around you so that you're not then spreading that infection. Um, because that can be a serious risk to young people and elderly people. Um, it really can, can be life threatening, especially for people who are in hospitals. Um, C. diff is a really common um, hospital associated infection and very, very difficult to treat. It really does have lasting effects on the gut. It's, um, you know, if you have to take really heavy doses of antibiotics, that's going to cause issues as well. So um, definitely, you know, if you're having these issues, go and get it checked out. It's not, I don't want to be frightening or anything like that, but it is not normal to have chronic diarrhea. Mm -hmm. And when we're chronic diarrhea is like, I don't know what chronic diarrhea, how you'd uh, define that. How would you define that? (laughs) Oh, I wouldn't want to give like a diagnostic criteria, but you know, if you're having diarrhea most days of the week, you probably want to go and get that checked out. 
um, because, you know, you just, just for your overall health, I mean, even quality of life, because that's not something that, you know, you should have to deal with where you're having urgency and, you know, you can't go to a place and, and like not know where the bathroom is, you know, those things are, it's embarrassing for sure. Um, but it's really worth going to your doctor about, and it could be even, you know, if, even if, if you're just experiencing it, like I said, said earlier with runner's trots, that's not necessarily a sign that you have, you know, pathology, but it could be a sign that your nutrition is not on point and that maybe, you know, you need to give some thought to what types of carbohydrates are you eating before, during, and after your workout, um, timing fiber appropriately and timing your fat intake appropriately and, um, ensuring that you have that good, you know, six to 8% carbohydrate concentration during an endurance event, because all of those things actually can help reduce GI symptoms and also even reduce um, the the post-workout uh, endotoxemia that some endurance athletes experience. So we actually see that, that with these extreme endurance events, especially if there's heat stress involved, that can actually increase gut permeability and allow for endotoxins, um, LPS, to, to exit the gut and cause an inflammatory response. So nutrition really does play a big role in, you know, not just performance, but also maintaining gut health. And then, you know, reduce Reducing those symptoms of, of uh, diarrhea afterwards so that you can, you know, effectively rehydrate and things like that. And one of the things we got asked about was uh, restoring gut health. And uh-huh. we already kind of got into potentially identifying kind of foods that could be causing something. Uh, is there anything mm-hmm. above that? Or I like obviously we talked about supplementation and potentially seeing your doctor and drugs. Is there anything outside of that that we can look to do before going down that route? Um, well, I am glad that you asked that because there are, I posted on my Instagram story a couple days ago. Um, there were, there are actually two big articles that just came out on probiotic supplementation. Um, and one of them, and, and so I will say right now, you know, this is one of the um, experiences where I thought, okay, I'm going to change my mind about something probably. Um, but they looked at post antibiotic probiotic supplementation. And this is something in the past that I said, yeah, it's probably prudent to take a probiotic after you've taken an antibiotic, because in some cases, antibiotics can really have a lasting uh, deleterious effect on the microbiome. I mean, it's sort of, you know, depending on the strength and, and the, the time that you're taking the antibiotic can be sort of like a slash and burn. Um, but I saw in this really interesting study that they were looking at, um, like, as I said, that post uh, antibiotic treatment probiotic supplementation. Now this was in healthy volunteers, which is an important caveat. Um, I'll talk about in just a second, but they found that after the antibiotics, they were readily enriched with the probiotic strains of bacteria. But then those probiotic strain, the people who, were enriched with those probiotic strains, then were sort of re- delayed in seeing a uh, replenishment of their own native bacteria. Now, the caveat to that is if you had severe dysbiosis, and while we don't really have like a specific um, profile for what that looks like, but in most cases we're saying, you know, you're lacking lactobacillus, you're lacking bifidobacterium, um, maybe acromantia, rosperia, and you're having increased numbers of um, like E. coli and streptococcus and things like that. If that was your native profile, it's probably not a bad thing that you don't get that back afterwards. But if you are a healthy individual who went on a round of antibiotics and then took probiotics, you may, according to this study, which, you know, they it, it's not a huge study, but it was well done. And they looked at it in terms of um, you know, taxonomic profiles as well as metagenomic profiles. So in terms of who's there and, and also their functions, um, then you could be delaying your own um, sort of regeneration of what you started with beforehand. And they saw this in mice as well, that it's actually, it may be better to just go back to your original diet and let that do the work for you. So what they found was more effective and what I I honestly hope will be the future is actually just fecal transplant. 
So this is taking, it can be from a donor or it can be your own uh, feces donation from before when you, before you started on the antibiotics, assuming you have a healthy gut or you get it from a donor who has a healthy gut. Um, and then in most cases, you will take that via the oral route of ingestion. There have been some studies that have used um, enema it forms so but the problem with that is that you can only go so far up into the colon and large intestine so um, you know you may be only depositing strains into like the distal portion of the large intestine into the colon whereas if you go through the oral route those pills are enterically coated so that they survive passage through your acidic stomach and then are deposited you know probably a little ways down the small intestine and that was actually better for replenishing their native bacteria, of course, because that was theirs. Um, and it seems to be a, a very effective treatment for resistant uh, C. diff infections. Um, so, you know, and I'm not sure why it hasn't really caught on because this is something that I had learned about a long time ago, like when I was back in grad school, I remember reading about it and like the little joke and it's what some of researchers were referring to it as repopulant, like you're going to re repopulate your gut. Um, but <laughs> that seems to be really beneficial because now instead of using just antibiotics, now you are using actual beneficial bacteria that are native to that gut. So that's a big thing is that, you know, in, in using like human probiotics for mice or using human bacteria in mice, mice seem to be actually pretty resistant to probiotic enrichment. And if we're testing probiotics on a mouse microbiome, we're looking at probiotics on a mouse microbiome, we can't necessarily extrapolate that to the human microbiome. So there's there's some significant limitations and these, these couple of papers that have just come out really highlighted those, um, not just that, but also the fact that, you know, we really can't say that our fecal samples are translatable to the profile of the entire gut. It's that these fecal samples, they're pretty close to what we see in the distal segments of the large intestine um, and in the colon. But when we're looking at small intestine, mm, we're not really getting a good representation there. So um, the other paper that, that I thought was really awesome is they were looking at at, uh, comparing individuals who are probiotic um, uh, permissive versus those who are probiotic resistant. So not everyone can even be, even if you give them the same probiotic, not everyone is going to be enriched in the same way. Some people will just expel those probiotics. This, this was one of the coolest papers because they didn't just use fecal samples. They actually went into the mucosa. They actually measured in the intestine. It was very invasive. And they were actually able to say, yes, we saw that probiotics were, were enriched here in the mucosa. Like they stuck to this person's gut and they're actually going to be able to probably do something there versus, oh yeah, we measured it in the feces. And, and so it's got to be in there because it's in the feces. Not necessarily. Um, we can say that like most people are probably going to have enrichment of probiotic bacteria in the feces, whether or not they're sticking, because you could have them sticking and proliferating and that's going to increase the numbers. Or you might just be pooping them all out and that's going to be a big waste of money. What I found really interesting was that they looked at, um, some of the factors that might influence uh, receptivity versus resistance. And they found that the cecum is really important. This plays a role. The cecum is sort of this little pouch that happens where the small intestine intersects with the large intestine. And because it's a little pouch, it's a great spot for food to just kind of hang out and bacterial species to um, proliferate. And they found that in the individual in individuals who were um, not receptive to these to these uh, who were resistant to the probiotics, there they had greater expressions of genes associated with innate immune response. Now this is a this is speculation. I'm going to put that out there right now. This is just me speculating, but. Um, because, you know, just looking at gene expression doesn't, t doesn't tell us the whole story. It doesn't say that this thing is actually happening. It's just that we have greater gene expression here. But that's really interesting because in individuals who have dysbiosis, there usually is greater inflammatory tone and greater innate immune system activity. 
So it could be that in individuals who have dysbiosis already, um, they may be less receptive, their guts may be less receptive to these probiotics. And they could be, you know, the ones who arguably might benefit even more um, from taking them. But because they have increased immune system tone, they may be more resistant to enrichment by those probiotics. The other big difference that they saw was that in an individual, you know, in, in, in individuals who already had high levels of these probiotic bacteria, they didn't see as great of an enrichment. So if you already have a an ideal gut profile you already have a lot of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium taking a probiotic is not necessarily going to be beneficial to you um now of course the media portrayed this like probiotics are not helpful and they may actually be damaging um and i wouldn't go that far but i would just say that you know maybe it's not ideal to take a probiotic after you've taken antibiotics maybe it is good to just go back to eating your normal diet if it was a nutritious diet and if you didn't have some you know intestinal issues before that um but i just think it goes to show that you know we we take a lot of these studies to be really um like well we're looking at specific things and this is really certain and we have to be more pragmatic about it and maybe a little bit more skeptical um, you know, I, I, I did another Instagram story a few days ago that pointed out how few studies we have on intermittent fasting and gut health, for example. And, you know, a lot of people are so big on IF right mm-hmm. now and they're really pushing, you know, oh, it's so beneficial. We have like three studies. Uh, on, one was in fruit flies. Uh, we got it in Drosophilia uh, for lifespan. So it's like we can't we can't necessarily extrapolate to say that that is usable in humans. And oftentimes it seems like that camp is also really like anti GMO and pro organic and and sort of ignores this breadth of and depth of evidence that these things are safe. And they say we need more studies on GMOs, but intermittent fasting will rebuild your gut microbiome. I <laughs> just I find that very frustrating. <laughs> Almost the opposite to what the evidence is even claiming. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. Super. Yeah. Frustra- I mean, even listening to you there, it just goes to show why people, I mean, even just reading abstracts isn't helpful, mm-hmm. particularly because, like anyone knows, like many of our listeners will be more in more knowledgeable more so on kind of training and nutrition papers and like with training papers there's people on the bell curve some people respond here 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 and like Mm -hmm. you're saying like there's people responding differently to kind of the procedures within the the probiotics so it's just fascinating and um yeah the the intermittent fast you have to agree i am seeing that promoted a lot especially for gut health and Mm -hmm. the fact that you've just stated i mean there's barely any studies and one of them's on fruit flies it's kind of almost um i'd say it's who recommend it to people because and basing your recommendations from the studies is almost a bit kind of um it's it's almost a wrong thing to do it's kind of like recommending a supplement after there's very few studies on it and i know there's been supplements where in future there's more studies that come out to show that it's now actually a negative thing for you to be doing so i think it's almost a little bit reckless to recommend when there are so few studies so i'm so thankful for having you on the podcast and yeah to kind of relay this information to a vast audience yeah, I appreciate you being so receptive and, and for people asking such great questions. And really, um, I mean, I've received so much support for about about my approach. And I realize that it's not, um, you know, uh, really as exciting because I'm not saying like, this will work and this will work and like, let me diagnose you. And, and you know, that, that's just not... I don't think that that's a prudent um, practice and I just like to be very cognizant of the limitations and really the, the, the techniques and sort of the technology behind how we're studying the gut bacteria, because that's something that, oh my gosh, when you look like metagenomics and, and unifrac and all this stuff, like these words that most people are not familiar with and they just don't make any sense. And a lot of people kind of, I think, and I even, you know, have had to do this in the past, like, oh, I, I don't really get that. I'm going to have to come back to that. And like, maybe you do, or maybe you just skim over that part. Um, but understanding how we are actually 
classifying the bacteria and how we're identifying those species really helps you understand, um, you know, our capabilities and our limitations as well. And then like what these findings actually mean, even if we talk about, you know, we have more bacteroides. Okay, well, what does that actually mean for a person? You know, just saying that we have more of this thing, that's like saying, oh, okay, um, well, we have more mm, wolves in this area, more foxes over here. Well, what effect does that actually have on the ecosystem? I think that's the question that a lot of people want to get to the bottom of. Um, but, you know, even some of these these tests, I, I've received a lot of questions about people who've spent quite a bit of money on on these breath tests. And that was a big thing that I thought, you know, this is probably going to be even more popular now because of that recent paper that came out on SIBO, the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And, um, you know, these people had, had really high levels of a specific form of lactate and were experiencing like brain fogginess and just, you know, general um, feelings of fatigue and malaise and, you know, they're all taking probiotics. And so we're, we're going to see this shift now, you know, it's, it's this a pendulum. Another thing that I posted from Myelene Fitness, he, he did a great little chart of like how trends change oh, yeah. so rapidly. And I, this is the, this is the pendulum. We went from, you know, probiotics are so great. They're going to cure all these things. And now it's probably going to be probiotics are useless at best and harmful at worst. And, um, you know, the, the, that breath test, uh, that there are different versions of this breath test, depending on the substrate that you give, we have accuracy from 20 to 90%. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, there's no gold standard for how that test is administered. Um, and because people can kind of do it in whatever way they see fit, they can actually influence the outcome then of that test. So if you are a person who's going to be selling supplements to someone because they have SIBO, you probably want to structure that test so that it will probably look like they have SIBO. Um, and they may not actually. So you can actually get some false positives. Um, and then, you know, looking more into tests that study um, gut permeability. So the lactulose mannitol test is one where we can uh, feed you this, this substrate and and then look at how it, um, the, the, like the time course of how it uh, is excreted in your urine. Um, that's not entirely standardized either. And so when you administer that test, depending on when you're measuring the excretion, you know, if you take it out to a couple hours versus four to six hours, you could be looking at, imper at permeability of the small intestine or of the large intestine. Um, so it's just very important to be aware of sort of the limitations of these tests, especially the, the um, breath tests, uh, because those seem to be abused somewhat and you know they're they're pretty commonly prescribed and you know just because you have a positive breath test that doesn't necessarily mean you have SIBO um, you could be looking at gas that's being produced in the large intestine which is fairly common um, so you know you you don't want to have all of these um, all the same bacteria throughout the gut you're going to have a specific profile in your small intestine versus in your large intestine so that it can become problematic if you do have large intestine bacteria in your small intestine but that breath test won't necessarily tell you that for sure um so that was another reason why i really liked those studies was because they actually went through and they they sampled at different segments of the gut and so you know it was very invasive those people had to go through colonoscopies and biopsies and things like that but you know we, we do we are served better by those types of studies versus the ones that might be a little bit easier and less expensive to just you know measure fecal samples um, but if you do measure fecal samples just be um, you know transparent about the yeah. limitations of what your of what your study is showing Nothing. and I always you know I'll knock myself for being like yes I, I used mouse models and all in my probiotics research you know so that's a significant limitation and it's okay we're looking at mechanisms but we have to be open about it no I definitely agree and I think it's just so fascinating to I mean to hear about and it's a fascinating area of research and I'm so glad that you were able to come on the podcast again and answer those questions for people and I'm sure I know you're already doing loads of work <laughs> researching it all the time so I'm sure we're gonna have to drag you on the podcast again in future but I just want to say a massive thank you for coming on this time um, it's been an absolute pleasure I'm sure we'll get a, a ton of questions through again and you'll probably have to do a load more research but I think that's great um, yeah. And yeah thank you for coming on and I want to say thank you for the listeners for staying tuned.
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much. And keep the questions coming because I love to keep learning and I will keep changing my mind as the evidence dictates.